welcome to the interview. Uh, today we, we have with us Jan Eliasson, who, who was the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as the President of the 60th Session of the General Assembly. And on the national level, he was a Swedish diplomat uh, working as a Minister for Foreign Affairs, as well as a Swedish Ambassador to Washington DC. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm very glad to join you. Thank you. And taking into account the current situation and the changing world, as well as 27th anniversary of the United Nations, I would like to ask you several questions. So starting off with the first one, um, in today's age of multilateralism and advanced globalization, how would you evaluate the um, uh, global community response to COVID-19 crisis? So what went well, what went wrong, and what are the lessons learned for further crises? Well, there were already before COVID-19 signs of uh, lacking support of multilateralism. Uh, we saw the US leaving the climate change agreement and also the work on migration compact and so forth. And uh, there was also discussions in the trade area, which pointed the direction of protectionism. So the trend even before the uh, COVID-19 was uh, rather negative to uh, international cooperation. When the COVID-19 struck, it struck so vehemently and also uh, across the world uh, with no distinction to any part of the world or any part segment of the population. So the, uh, the, the, the pandemic was mainly seen as a national disaster because it was concerned it, it hit the, your own nation, your own citizens. And of course, that strengthened the uh, element of working inward rather than working outward. And I must say that the international dimension uh, was not as strong as I would have hoped. Uh, we, there were national plans, but you saw the strains on international cooperation in several areas. For instance, the European Union, there were even difficulties exporting uh, material that was necessary to fight the uh, COVID. Uh, and Italy asked for help, and it didn't receive the kind of help they had hoped. Now there is a discussion of a financial package, but the national dimension was dominating. Uh, and uh, the fact that we now also have a big dispute between US and China, and the importance of uh, WHO, which is not accepted by the United States, makes the international dimension even weaker. But my absolute conviction is that we have to work together. The, together is the most important word in the world right now. And uh, that goes for you know, sharing information to uh, developing a vaccine together and seeing pandemics as a global challenge. So uh, in brief, short answer is no, uh, it was not as strong an international dimension in dealing with this COVID-19 crisis as I would have wanted but I hope that we will return to accepting that we are in this boat together. We swim, we sink together. Thank you very much. And taking that into account, how do you see the relationship between the US and China and mm -hmm. what implications can it have on the whole world as we know that it's all interconnected and even though we are often not cooperating very closely, it still has some uh, results on us. Well, in, uh, comp in the same way as I answered your first question, there were already signs of tension between US and, and China before COVID-19. We had uh, rather difficult negotiations on trade. There were disputes on the South China Sea. There were even risk of military incidents in that area. There is always the uh, big divisive issue of Taiwan seen from the US and the Chinese perspectives. Uh, and uh, when the COVID-19 struck, in the beginning, there was a declaration of several, were several declarations of the US of support and understanding of the Chinese situation. But growingly, um, the uh, debate turned in the direction of criticism of China in the way it had handled the uh, pandemic in the beginning, probably rightly so in terms of information internally and externally, uh, but also Unfortunately, this issue became also a domestic political issue. So uh, it, you know, in the United States, it's evident that the uh, president is using the uh, China, uh, Chinese origin of the uh, pandemic 
as part of the political campaign. And this is, of course, seen in, the, in China as a way of uh, affecting the geopolitical situation in a negative way. And unfortunately to them, the COVID-19 uh, situation has led to a rather serious political problem, even crisis, I would say, in terms of the work at the United Nations. Uh, Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres uh, proposed early on that we should use the pandemic situation and the huge problem of that pandemic to have a global ceasefire. All the conflicts in the world should affect, should, be, um, should respect a uh, ceasefire. And I thought myself that was self-evident support uh, expected from, to, have, to be seen from the uh, UN, US Security Council, because it was so strongly related to their mission, in standing up for international peace and security. But for almost three months now, this discussion has been going, on, been going on in the council and they still have not come up with the support of this resolution. Uh, that comes back to the problems between China and the US. The Chinese saw that this was an infringement of sovereignty, putting in doubt their own institutions work on this. And the uh, US uh, was not uh, accepting that WHO would be commended or at least mentioned in that resolution. And of course, here you see the uh, problems of US-China developing into a problem for the key organ of the United Nations Security Council, and thereby weakening the position of the UN. The General Assembly has behaved, has worked better and come up with a resolution. And uh, member states individually are supporting WHO, even taking up the slack from the United States. But uh, all in all, the US-China uh, relationship is a shadow hanging over the world right now. And there are even those who fear that this could turn into a new Cold War, which could be very dangerous, where the uh, pandemic issue is one issue, but where there are several others, other factors also. Thank you very much. And that's very, very interesting what you said, also taking into account your experience as the diplomat, also as a Swedish diplomat. And um, taking that in mind, I would like to ask you, how do you evaluate the policy of Sweden not to implement the wide lockdown as almost all um, countries in the EU did? Sweden decided not to and decided not to impose the lockdown as, as we know, for example, in Poland that we are located or in, in uh, Western Europe. What do you think about this policy? Well, I think you shouldn't see this as a complete uh, disregard for the lockdown. We, I myself am living in quarantine, more or less, because of my age. Uh, and uh, we have uh, rules on social distancing that are respected uh, by most people, I would say almost all people. Uh, we decided not to, to close the schools uh, because we had medical advice and even uh, evidence that uh, children were not affected uh, as much as other age groups. And this made it possible for personnel in the, uh, in the uh, sector of, uh, of hospitals and schools to you know, be in school and by that keep the society going. So we have, everything is built on, uh, shall I say, voluntary decisions, voluntary steps. We are an old democracy and we trust the people. And what is interesting in my country is that also people trust Swedish institutions in general. So when the, uh, we get the recommendations, uh, we follow them, even if it's not uh, something that is, uh, is followed by the police or checked by authorities. So, but all in all, we are very cautious. I would admit though that we have a very big problem in terms of how the uh, COVID-19 has affected old people. Uh, the, we have had a definitely too high a mortality as compared to our neighbors, for instance. Uh, and it is evident that we have not taken into account the weak spots of uh, old age homes. Uh, we have had people working there, which uh, without you know, full time jobs and thereby making them go to work even if they felt bad, felt uh, sick. Uh, we have little training and uh, 
generally uh, that sector was left out at the beginning of the pandemic. So we paid a pretty heavy price, which we, will, we are now discuss better. I'm sure we will reform the whole old age homes situations. Uh, but all in all, uh, this line that has been chosen has been basically supported by the people. It sort of fits our traditions and uh, the way we work. The economic life has been going on relatively uh, unaffected, except of course that the markets have disappeared for some uh, industry sectors and so forth. But people normally have gone to work, although this type of contact that you and I have right now has become extremely common. I think I've had 10 Zoom conversations the last two or three weeks. Um, so we do our work in a different way. And uh, we of course respect the seriousness of this pandemic. Um, I hope that in the end uh, it will turn out, our strategy will turn out to be, have worked, except that I think the loss of old age people is going to be quite a stain on, on the history of this uh, disease. Thank you very much. And I think it's also very interesting what you said that it's about willingness and faith in people, um, in the Swedish people. And um, that's also kind of my next question, which concerns sustainable development and uh, Sweden being a leader in achieving Agenda 2030 implementation. Um, why do you think it's so? Why do you think Sweden is the leader? Um, in uh, actions leading to sustainable development. Also, it's very interesting in regards to COVID-19 because we know that there are almost uh, 19 uh, ministers of ecology and environment uh, of EU uh, member states who said that they want, to, uh, they want the response to be green, they want the response to be sustainable uh, because we don't want to do it twice. What do you think about it? Well, first of all, I'm very glad that you consider us a leader in the work on sustainability and SDGs. I myself, as Deputy Secretary General, negotiated this together with my successor, Amina Mohammed, for four and a half years. So uh, I spent uh, a large part of my recent years uh, with these issues. If I want to explain it from the Swedish perspective, I would say that we are committed very much to uh, policies of solidarity with the developing countries. We uh, have put this very high up on our agenda, accepted by almost all political parties. We are one of the few countries that are giving 1% of our GDP to uh, developing assistance. So we wanted to, we have always been standing up for solidarity with the, the countries who are less fortunate. Secondly, we are a country also which has been very strongly committed to a clean environment clean air, clean water, uh, and uh, also aware of the uh, deterioration in the world climate. And we have had excellent uh, researchers uh, who have uh, brought out the issue of climate change very strongly. So uh, I would say the combination of solidarity with poor countries uh, in combination with an awareness of the environment is probably what uh, brought this about. I'm very proud though that the sustainability work is not only connected to development, because it is also through the SDGs development to peace, uh, connected to peace and connected also to uh, the health of institutions and rule of law. Uh, I would hope that it have been a stronger connection to human rights, but still this broader relationship between peace, uh, development and human rights is a formula that we believe in very strongly. You mentioned that I've been president of the General Assembly. 2005 and 6, and I'm very proud of the formula that we then established, which I think is extremely crucial for the United Nations and for all international work and even national work. And that formula is the following. It says that there is no peace without development, but there is no development without peace, and none of the above without respect of human rights, rule of law, and rule of law. The, that formula says it all, and uh, the SDGs is a a, a, uh, sort of a, 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 a concentration of these uh, three issues. Uh, and I think it will be also seen later on after the pandemic as the way to go when it comes to action on uh, the climate change. There is a connection between pandemics, the pandemic and, and uh, climate and uh, in, uh, sustainability. We are not at peace with nature, so to speak. You see that there is a relationship between humans and animals when it comes to 
uh, the, this, the pandemics and this will be a problem in the future. But also there, there is going to be a need to look into the kind of life we lead and the kind of conclusions we draw from the corona experience. And I think it's extremely important that we then see that we build back better as it is expressed sometimes in humanitarian work where I was active. After an earthquake, we always said build back better. And I think now we need to really connect better to the next generation issues, which have been there all the time and slightly forgotten now, but we have to get in there and we will find in my view that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, will be an extremely important tool to repair the world. Because in these 17 goals and the many targets under these goals, it's like a huge plan of action for also the climate change agenda. If you look at the Paris, Paris Agreement, there is really no action plan. But the SDGs is in fact the action plan, the toolbox to repair the world. And as a friend of mine said, it's the uh, survival kit for humanity. So um, if you are kind enough to give Sweden credit for be driving the driving force in this work, we're very proud. But now it's important that we don't forget what challenge we have. Uh, I have felt recently there has been a slowdown in engagement on the SDGs. We have to get going on that even while the pandemic is going on so that we can move fast once the pandemic hopefully is behind us. Thank you and I fully agree with you and I thank you for um, showing the interdependence between various the aspects also between various SDGs because I think it's very crucial also in today's debate. Um, as several people perceive climate change as one of the biggest challenges not only of tomorrow but also of today. So I would like to ask you what's in your opinion the biggest challenge uh, of security today? Is it climate change? Is it cyber security? Is it preventing armed conflicts as you work also in humanitarian uh, Field. What do you think? What's, which one of the aspects, or maybe all of them, are the most important? Well, unfortunately, uh, there are several big risks, uh, several big dangers. I am now a chair of the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, chair of the board, uh, and we have analyzed uh, the threats uh, that we see for the future and even presently. and. Uh, I could first identify, of course, the enormous risks with the uh, arms race and the nuclear uh, developments. We have seen a uh, lacking cooperation between US and Russia, which were the two powers mostly uh, building up a uh, disarmament architecture. It's over now. The US has left the uh, Iran nuclear deal. The US and Russia both left the INF, the Intermediate Nuclear Force uh, Agreement. Uh, two days, or a couple of days ago, US left the Blue, the Skies, Open Skies Initiative, which is important as a confidence building measure for disarmament. Uh, and now there is still danger that the new START agreement that expires on the 5th of February next year is also in danger. So uh, we may be facing a period of um, um, having no agreements between the major actors. China has expressed less interest also in joining any of these structures. And uh, in the laboratories uh, in several of the major countries, there are developments of so-called tactical nuclear weapons, which takes away the sharp line between, com con between conventional warfare and nuclear warfare. And uh, the latest rumor that I heard, which I hope to God is not true, is that there are considerations about new nuclear tests among members of the permanent five, the, the major powers. So we can't disregard the uh, risks of conflict, even in the nuclear area. I am hate to say that this is something that has appeared even as a risk uh, growingly. Uh, and with the uh, growing problems, as you and I have discussed between China and the US, with also some military dimensions, if you look at the Taiwan situation or South China Sea and the Korean Peninsula, then you realize that this is something we cannot disregard. So I think we should, all world public opinion should, for instance, now work very hard to make sure that the US and Russia extends the uh, new START agreement in February next year. So there your organization can play a role. The other risks that I would point to are in the area of something that I 
as a young diplomat never worked with because I was a diplomat mostly during the Cold War and I was mostly looking at so-called hard security, which was the, what I just mentioned. But I would say that we must show much more interest and engagement in, in, uh, in broader definition of security. Climate change is a threat to sec our security. It leads to uh, huge uh, changes in uh, temperature, uh, to in droughts and floods and uh, rising sea levels uh, with enormously uh, serious consequences on social and economic life and even political life. Uh, and of course also a phenomenon like migration. People will have to leave because of climate change in millions in years to come with all the tensions that that could lead to, including political tensions, by the way, in Europe and the United States, as we already have seen. So climate change is one thing. And then uh, we cannot disregard what is happening right now. Pandemics is also a threat to our security. You see how it has struck us quickly and, and very, very hard uh, in our, all over the world right now. And uh, it has a tremendous effect in uh, the rich countries. But can you imagine if this breaks out in the serious way it has, for instance, in, in Italy and Spain, United States and Brazil, if that is the case in Africa or a uh, large part of Asia, with countries where clean water is a luxury, in countries where you live with eight, nine people in one room, and where there are no big fiscal financial packages or programs to set up to, to, um, to compensate for loss of income. So uh, I would say that it is important that we see security in the broader context, not only hard security, but also the, uh, the broader aspects of security related to climate change and pandemics. There is also, of course, the uh, cyber security that you mentioned yourself, which is an area which is uh, shrouded in secrecy. Uh, it's mostly intelligence organizations that know what's going on and private se sector companies that don't want to share industrial secrets. I remember when we tried to get something going in the UN on cyber security, it was so difficult to get the facts. And as you know, you've got to start with facts, not alternative facts in today's world. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it's some dangerous, but I, I would also like to say there is hope uh, because otherwise you will get completely uh, uh, in despair and, <laughs> and uh, one, uh, disappointed about uh, the lack of uh, optimism and light. I usually say that I'm an optimist, but I'm growingly an, a worried optimist. But I think there is hope and I think the hope is something that might interest you that I see. The first one is women. I think it's a tremendous untapped resources in today's world. I think women will play an enormous role. If you look at women running countries like New Zealand and Germany and, uh, and Finland and some of the other Nordic countries, they are the ones who take uh, the best initiatives dealing with the COVID-19. But women, I think, uh, being a force of change is something I believe in enormously strongly. And it's something that men should fully be behind and mobilize in favor because it is very good for everybody. It's not only a question of the emancipation of women, it's a question of the emancipation of man. And man is both men and women. The second hope that I have is uh, young people. I, I have been going to schools with my grandchildren, uh, spend some, half a day with them, I come back rejuvenated in the evening, my wife says. And uh, I'm full of hope because the uh, instincts of the children and young people is completely perfect for me in terms of climate, in terms of peace and war, in terms of how you are with human beings, in terms of truth, lies. Uh, so uh, I think we should learn to work not only for young people, we, should, we have a duty to do that. Many young people fare very badly, even in rich societies. But I think we should work more and more with, with young people, not only for young people, with young people, taking, accepting that they should play a role and, and, and take responsibility early on for the development of our societies because we are in a hurry, we can't wait too long. The third reason for, chair, for, for hope is uh, knowledge, and science and technology and uh, education. It's a tremendously positive factor. And I think this type of, system that we have now is if it was done well, could be a very positive factor. And the last 
uh, I should say last, the fourth hope is of course international cooperation. I believe very, very strongly in international cooperation. And even if the UN is in, criticized by some, I think United Nations still will be the top organization that we will need in the future. Thank you very much. And I think the last, uh, the last hope that you mentioned um, is actually um, the reason why, uh, why three of previous ones are not educated enough. Because if we knew that um, women should be included in the decision making, if we knew that uh, kids and young people should be also included and we should re really focus on international cooperation, I think the fourth hope of uh, international, multilateral and also multi-generational dialogue would work. And I think the UN wouldn't be criticized so much as it is now. And I also very often see that uh, even though the UN very often tries its best, as I know it for uh, several projects that I participate in, um, tries very, very much to be active as well as to re reply to several challenges that appear in the world, is often criticized, as you said, uh, because people don't really know what the UN is doing on the field, on local level. Uh, they only know that P5 are not doing enough, uh, Security Council is not doing enough, and that's what appears in media. And how how do you see it? How do you evaluate it? And also, what kind of reforms um, do you see as we face 75, 75th anniversary of the UN this year? What are your hopes for the future in regards to the anniversary of the UN? Well, you, all, you already pointed to a, a very important factor, is that we have to make United Nations work relevant to people on the ground, people in our countries, people on all levels, particularly those who are less fortunate. people who are vulnerable and suppressed. And uh, I happen to have the charter at my side here at my computer. Uh, we should remember the first three words of this charter. The first three words of this charter is we the peoples. And we should measure the success of the United Nations, how effectively we reach people on peace and development and human rights and rule of law. That means that we should try to, in the connection with the 75th anniversary, send that message very powerfully that this organization is meant to stand up for fighting the scourge of war, standing up for the dignity and worth, equal worth of, of all human beings, the rule of law, and life and social and economic progress, which is in the preamble of this beautiful charter. That has, for that work, we have to be committed and, and it requires that member states, of course, accept this. The United Nations becomes as strong as the member states want it to be. I always said when I was working at the UN and I continue to do so that UN is a mirror, a reflection of two things. It's a mirror of re the reflection as it is. And it's not a pretty place right now. And it, is seen in the failure of the Security Council to come to resolution on COVID-19 and ceasefires. It is seen by disputes where proxy wars are developing between countries. Uh, it is seen in uh, less resources going to development and these enormous resources going to armaments. The figures that CPRI have just announced now are the, are the highest ever. The cost for one year, 2019, of military expenditure was $1,917 billion, almost $2 trillion. It's just, in my view, I dare say now when I'm not more in diplomacy, it's an obscene figures. And I think the UN has a role in disarmament, a role in, in standing up to be a moral arbiter. But what I said was that it's a reflection of two things, the world as it is, but of course, we must never forget that it is also a reflection of the world as it should be. And it is our job to diminish the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. And we must never forget that we must have a vision of peace and development and human rights to stand up for both internationally and nationally. When we have a vision, then the work, the daily work becomes so much easier. You need to have principles in, uh, to guide you in your life. And I say that to you as a young person and the people that are behind you and with you, that 
you should perhaps think of something I learned from one of my mentors whom I've never met, but he, his name was Dag Hammarskjöld. He was a secretary general uh, between 1953 and 61. He died in an air crash, mysteriously, by the way. And he once said in one of his uh, uh, sayings and reflected in a book called Waymarks or Markings, he said that the future is two things. The future is the horizon, the vision. But he also said the future is not only the horizon, it's also the every step you take tomorrow. But you will reach the goal if you, you will reach a goal if you know the where you want to go, but you should also know that there's a lot of hard work to get there. So fu the future is both this vision that I think this charter well, it very much represents, but it's also a lot of hard work. And you can't just be up there in the sky and the blue skies and things that that's United Nations. You've got to be down there and do hard work. Uh, and we have, and you have, your generation, lots of hard work ahead of you. But you should know that uh, with your capacity, your dreams and aspirations and women and young people and uh, the enormous potential in knowledge and science and uh, deciding that you will not go the inward uh, looking way or backward looking way, but rather choose the outward looking and, and forward looking way and come to the conclusion that I would say two words uh, must guide us now. I've already mentioned one, together, which is a key word, of course, for international cooperation and cooperation generally, also at home, by the way. But the other word is responsibility. We need to take responsibility for the shape of the world as it is, and we must fight the forces that now will force us back into polarization, division, and uh, also uh, using hatred and divisive methods to uh, to immobilize our common action which is necessary so you have a great task ahead of you i wish i were young and come <laughs> and join you but i'm glad that una poland is active and that you work in the spirit so that your questions uh, hint and indicate <laughs> Uh, and wish I wish you all the best. And uh, I have great expectations and hopes for you for the future. Thank you very much. And I think also that this interview will show people that each of us is responsible for the UN. And if we want to criticize the United Nations, we should also be part of it. And we should contribute not to be able to criticize. Because as long as we just stand by and criticize the organizations, we don't have it, we don't have the right to do so. And I also uh, feel very honored that you quoted Doug Hammersfield uh, because he also said very important words that I think fit this question very well, that uh, the UN was not created to take uh, mankind to heaven, but to save humanity from hell, which mm. is very often said as cliche, but I think mm. it's very important to remind it uh, to people that criticize the United Nations because Indeed. they should be aware that without the United Nations, we wouldn't be able to achieve so many great things in the modern world. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank That's what I want much. to That's exactly what I want to say with the with the uh, being a mirror both of the world as it is and the world as it should be. Never give up the world as it should be, but be very tough and knowledgeable about the world as it is. And by that you will be better prepared to really change things in the years to come. Yeah, I fully agree. And thank you very much once again for you. your time and for answering our questions and for also educating uh, Polish youth on the UN and uh, job as the diplomat. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to you.